Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the age-old question, why should women vote for a misogynist? Our guest for the show is Jean Rosenfeld, independent scholar. And what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about how, how misogyny may differ from culture to culture, and uh, what's the drift around the world. And is misogyny a cultural thing, or is it something more... Does it have something to do with family? Uh, it, does it reflect the dynamic, cultural dynamic in family? Does it reflect some kind of DNA thing? Uh, the suffragettes worked so hard um, to get the vote, and now it's a kind of squander when women do not vote as a group against an obvious misogynist. So Jean Rosenfeld, our special guest, our esteemed guest, can you address these things? Can you start off with exactly what is a misogynist and where does that come from? I like to uh, talk from information I have gained through my own education, not through just my personal opinions or my life experience. Although when my life experience can illuminate something I learned from documentation, then I may bring it up or experience of other people I have known, okay? Um, misogyny is, I think, basically a power relationship in society. And it is um, also part of mythology. It is part of human relations. And it's part of history, uh, which I feel more comfortable talking about. Uh, a lot of times, in a power relationship, we have sexual dimorphism in the human species, meaning most males are larger than most females on average, meaning they're also stronger. And um, therefore, in a um, hunter-gatherer society or a uh, pastoral society, men can outperform women when it comes to strength and coercion. We still have coercive relationships in our modern society. We see this in terms of uh, records of uh, data on uh, uh, sexual abuse, but also on uh, marital abuse, which is commonplace in some societies. What we think of today as sexual and marital abuse or ped pedophilia or uh, euphobophilia, which is uh, when older males uh, uh, have a sexual relationship with a teenage girl, uh, more the Lolita phenomenon, uh, then uh, in these cases, um, women are at a, girls are at a disadvantage. But considering that in the United States, 37 out of our 50 states still have laws on the books that permit marriage of older adult men with girls under the age of 18, we can see the persistence of these types of power relationships in history. So we may reframe them or clothe them differently in our modern society, but they still exist. And the whole um, rationalization for women uh, as, as being subject to the power of men, the decision-making of men, the preference uh, in terms of independence, independent uh, behavior and freedom in men. Just think of uh, the idea of, of all the different words we have for a woman that is sexually, quote, promiscuous. And uh, how many of different words do we have for men that are sexually promiscuous? So it's, it's basically ingrained in society. It's very patriarchal. And it's not just Western. It's not a Western patriarchal thing, because perhaps some of the worst abuses of women occur in Asia, in places like uh, India or Pakistan. So it, it's a pretty pervasive thing. Well, is it is it built in, like, into the species? You kind of alluded to that, is it, you know, because of the, the, the power size of men versus women. Uh, and if it's built into the species, will it always be thus? Well, it couldn't be built into the, the species without some cooperation initially on the part of women. And I'll tell you where that might come from. I had a little, I'm bringing in now my personal experience. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in my 20s in a very remote and uh, very primitive uh, small village in the mountains in Central America. 
and it was heavily Catholic. And these, this was a peasant society. So peasants are people who live on the margins and they're conservative because they don't like change because if you introduce change, it could be uh, life-threatening. They, 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 have a, they live on a knife edge in terms of survival. So they don't like change. And the older women in a community who are no longer having children are not distracted by that, some of whom uh, have husbands and some of whom husbands have died because life is precarious and have uh, support from their sons or other people. They're, they are the ones who enforce the rules about women having children. Uh, women uh, should not use birth control. Uh, it's against the religion, and religion is a series of rationalizations about power structures, marriage structures, um, sexual uh, behaviors. I think of the Catholic Church and how much uh, think it has spilled on the notion of marriage is just for procreation, and that procreation should not be interfered with by birth control. And uh, a woman, a woman is idolized and become sanctified as a saint for uh, giving up her life for her children uh, and uh, being a helpmate to her husband or suffering abuse in, in silence. All of these things are a built-in misogyny into the religion, with, but it, it, it's bought into by women themselves who teach this to their daughters. Then they, they have a flip side to that. Well, women are noble. Uh, women will sacrifice more. Uh, women uh, uh, create peace. Men go to war. You have all of these mythologies and consequences that young girls buy into. Uh, marriage is um, you save your virginity for marriage, and you are you are uh, more treasured because of that. Uh, you become an icon. So you trade your power for your status as a human being, and if you live to a ripe old age and you're fortunate enough to do that, then you're revered. Then you are um, put on a pedestal. The mother-in-law or the grandmother um, is put on a pedestal. Whereas in modern society, when women are free from a lot of these constraints, they can use birth control, they can be so sexually uh, discriminatory. They don't have to get married. They don't have to have children. They can use abortion. In that case, Older women are the least valued members of society sociologically. I can speak as one right now. Um, is that that there's trade-offs in power structures, in status structures. And I think power and status is built into the human species because we are animals, after all. Um, that's where we came from. Not strictly speaking, Adam and Eve. There were a lot of Adam and Eves. There were a lot of human species at one point, up to about thirty or forty thousand years ago. There were variations on human species, how they could interbreed, but it wasn't easy. And uh, now we are uh, one species of human that survived, and we are more alike than we've ever been in history genetically. So we are all quite genetically related, and we all share a lot of this um, a tendency uh, to impulse and emotion. And, and of course, uh, humans are not uh, tied down to having sex only at certain intervals in their lives, like many animal species are. They can only interbreed at certain times. We are, um, 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 well, omni-behavioral when it comes to sex. We can have it any time, up to a certain point in our lives. Women can. The other thing is that having a child puts a woman out of commission to her husband for a couple of years because there were no formulas in, in the older world, even in the pre-modern world. Uh, women nursed children and uh, nur a nursing child uh, was dependent on mother's milk until that child could be weaned food. And that was usually about two years. And also that creates birth control. You, you generally do not conceive when you are a full nursing mother. So what happens is women's attention is caught up by their child and the child care while the man is out doing whatever the man needs to do up to the recent times in providing for the family. And poly, um, uh, polygamy is widespread. It's much more widespread than uh, monogamous marriage ever be, uh, what, uh, recently, because 
women just can't do it all. I mean, we know we can't do it all. So having a co-wife, and, and we'll take the Mormons as the most recent experience of that when they were settling. A very, very successful community. I, I think largely because of polygamy, frankly. Now, also domestic abuse may be less. I'm just guessing here. But in a polygynous household uh, where a man has choices, uh, he maybe has a favorite wife, maybe he takes a younger wife, um, maybe he doesn't, he isn't uh, going through sexual dry spells as he would in a monogamous marriage if he were truly monogamous and the wife had a child and they were all caught up in the child. Um, nevertheless, uh, there may be less domestic abuse because, there, first of all, there are more women. And secondly, he has less reason for it. So, or to get, you know, depend too much on one woman. So there are a lot of different reasons and there are trade-offs why people go for this. And today's in today's world among the... Uh, fundamentalist Christianity and, and uh, evangelicals, I'm not saying all evangelicals are all fundamentalist groups, but there's a very strong dependence on the letters of uh, the Apostle Paul, and he's misinterpreted by a lot of the theologians in these movements, saying that the man is the head of the household and the woman, and, and the man is, is the head of the woman. That's not really what Paul meant. Paul was not for marriage at all. Paul expected the, uh, Jesus to return on earth, maybe in his lifetime. And he didn't want people to get married and all caught up in each other when they had to be thinking about that. But he did say in terms of communities where there was a lot going on in Paul's communities, there were a lot of sexual sins happening and he had to deal with that. So he said things in a very nuanced way. But when you read the text today from some of these modern day pastors and radio show hosts and things it was very different from that. They're going back to in basically enforcing the Victorian notion that the woman is uh, subject to the man. See, there's a lot to unpack from what you've said. But I'll, I'll try to, you know, and I should have been making notes on all the issues, but it, it strikes me, you said that it's different in different cultures and the culture that comes to mind are the migrants, the migrants from the, the Middle East and North Africa, when they come into Europe, um, the woman doesn't necessarily work. The woman is in charge of the household. Uh, the woman is, um, you know, dedicated to having as many children as possible. Now, on the one hand, this, this has ultimately a political effect because you have more votes that way in any given democratic society. But the other, the other aspect of it is that um, this is this is historical, and the the family is driven by this notion of male superiority, and the woman stays home in the kitchen in the bedroom, and that's the way it is. And it seems very strong, because these families um, do exactly that. They're they're the family. The family institution is limited to that, you know, like uh, the whole issue in Afghanistan. Don't go to school. Um, you have to you wear the hajib. Um, you 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 can't dance or watch a movie, um, and it, you know it's supposed to be religious, but in fact I think it's it's more than religious. It goes back way back, and it's the role of the woman is uh, subordinate to the role of the man, and and we are going to make rules that uh, perpetuate that subordination. Um, so it seems to me that when you say it's different in different cultures, you're really talking about the culture in the Middle East and North Africa, aren't we? Well, partly. Um, I, I'm going to go with a little slogan that uh, kind of encapsulates the European uh, patriarchal view, and it's in German. It's uh, Kinder, Kuche, and Kirche. And Kinder is children, Kuche is kitchen or cooking. And uh, Kirsha is church. So the woman's life revolves around those three things. And that's pervasive. I grew up in a monogamous uh, marriage with my sister where that was, in fact, my father had the car. He went out to work. My mother stayed home. And um, we went to church with her every Sunday. My father did not go to church. She cooked every single meal. Even when she got up and went to school full time, she wanted to go to college. She never had a chance to go to college. <laughs> she went to college for five years, got her master's degree, and made dinner every single night. 
every meal. We did not go out to eat. So this notion that women today have maintained the kinder kusha, uh, kircha, um, slogan, the, the, the ideal, the ideal woman, um, and trying also to have a, a job part-time or full-time, have children, have a, a marriage in which communication and uh, sexual relations are normal. Um, this is just too much. It's overburdening. So what we have today, especially among the ultra-conservative movement, is, um, first of all, go back to the ideal. Don't uh, change anything in the patriarchal ideal. Just give up your um, ambitions to be anything other than that and uh, be content because that's what your nature is for. And by that, you actually do a service to men because um, they're, they're much more pacific and uh, happy individuals when a, a woman commits herself to service of home and family. In other cultures, like the Middle East or Latin America when I was there. It had the highest birth rates in the world there. Or Africa or the ultra-conservative or ultra-Orthodox among Jews. All of these are, are known to have large families. It was not unusual for women in Central America to have 20 pregnancies or 13 living children. But part of that was in the past, of course, there was high infant mortality. So people had more children and they lost more children. Think of um, Mary Todd Lincoln and what she went through in her life, for example, losing her, her boys. Uh, it, was, it was traumatic. And uh, so, so people wanted more children. They needed more children in an agricultural uh, economy because they needed people working on the farms and then they needed, there were no old age homes, so they needed to take care of their aged parents and so forth. So having large families, but what we have found out in terms of demography and why demography is plummeting and uh, the more advanced a society is, that when families and women particularly move to urban areas, they have fewer children. I was a co-mom with a young woman uh, who was in her 20s and she's still my best friend. And she came from Central America and at the age of like 18, she had two small children uh, that she left there. She had two children her whole life because she emigrated to an urban area, took a job and became a migrant who was a very successful uh, migrant, now has American citizenship, her own home, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so forth. It's, a, it's an amazing story. In one generation, you could, that, that demography can change from a woman having, say, 12 children to a woman having two children. And that's what's been happening. So as these migrants come into the advanced areas, they will not have, their daughters and sons will not have as many children, and the demography will, will change. Well, this sounds like, um, you know, the Republican slogan, the MAGA slogan, make America great again. And you wonder what great means. I, I mean, this discussion actually elucidates that. Um, America was great in the view of those MAGA people uh, when we had the old, the old model uh, where the woman was at home uh, cooking and cleaning and having children. Uh, I think they, I think they're actually, uh, in, uh, they're thinking of that when they say, uh, make America great again. Remember that in the 19th century, you've painted the picture of the 19th century, largely agricultural, needed a lot of children. Children were assets, got to keep them at home, got to, got to keep the farm going and all that. But by the time of the suffragettes, um, there was a notion of liberation in the air, and you've alluded to that. And so, you know, it's, at least at some level in this country, and maybe it's, uh, I don't know if it runs parallel historically or, you know, just uh, or one country, one culture emulating another, but women have had a certain amount of liberation. What's extraordinary now with all of that liberation, uh, with all the changes you've described over the past hundred years or more, you know, since the suffragette movement, um, we seem to be yearning to go back, uh, to roll it back, and to have the same patriarchal structure as we did before. Um, this is really kind of shocking when you think of it that way. And one of the things on the ballot, I would say, is going back. Um, your thoughts about how all of this interplays with modern politics. The 
best example of how this interplays with modern politics is the Dobbs decision on the Supreme Court and the fight we have been having over abortion for 30 or, well, how many years it's been. Um, but be, because there have been murders about this, uh, murders uh, on theological basis uh, of murdering uh, doctors who provide abortion, of arson of abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood clinics, which do a lot more than abortion, by the way, in terms of taking care of a woman's maternal health and are open to women in society who are minorities or very poor, whose statistics on infant mortality and maternal mortality and uh, morbidity are much higher than they are in the middle class and among uh, white people. So um, we are taking down a whole structure that provides for women in perhaps the most important um, thing they do for society. I mean, what, what is the most important job in a society? It's to produce the next generation and to rear it responsibly. And, and indeed, if you don't do that, the society begins to wither. We've seen that with the bell curve, haven't we? Yes, and, and this re retreat to patriarchal uh, 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 ideals comes also partly from uh, one of the roots of uh, modern neo-fascism in America is the Ku Klux Klan. And they revered antebellum, uh, pre-Civil War society at the upper classes, the upper levels, because again, women who belong to the peasant class and men too, they don't have the, the, the quite as strict uh, bifurcation of roles as the uh, gentry class. The gentry class uh, has a lot more leisure time and they can divide the roles and, and create the ideals and the mythologies about this. But women were not equal to men in any way, shape or form in uh, antebellum society. But, but the mythology says they were just as valuable in their own way. They just didn't have the right to make decisions about what they were going to do in life, how they were going to do it, whom they were going to marry, if they were going to marry, if they were going to have children or not have children. You see, once women become truly equal to where they can decide how many children am I going to have? When am I going to have a child? Uh, am I going to have a child? Do I need to get married? Do I need to I was father and we've got some other accommodations? What do I want to be in life? Do I want to be a physicist or a teacher? Or um, do I want to, uh, you know, create a business? These were not available. And so there is an attraction for people to simplify and avoid all these decisions by just giving up your decision making to uh, a group where everything is decided. I can't really reconcile somebody like Amy Coney Barrett with her life and her role right now. I mean, she has attained an equal high status performance level in society that is rarely achieved by anybody, much less a woman. And yet she is a member of an ultra conservative Catholic sect in which there are strict ideas about marriage, birth control, children, performance, and so forth. She's wasn't she, wasn't she the one who said that the religion is more important? Um, I, she's a very staunch Catholic. Yes, because, you know, to be that kind of a Catholic is to experience a different thing in life than most people experience who are not very religious, which is there is great satisfaction and pleasure in the spiritual life. And if the spiritual life is reconciled with your material life, your daily life, in ways in which you can derive satisfaction and pleasure, then you feel you have the best of all possible worlds. But how she can step out of that and be a Supreme Court justice in the polarized atmosphere of day, I've got to believe that this gal is evolving as people have been saying, and she will continue to evolve. Well, she starts out with a kind of a conflict. 
Let me go back to something you were saying about the, the life in these, um, you know, United States antebellum. Slavery, okay? And slavery has existed since, uh, oh, you can tell me better, but a long, long time in the human condition. Uh, one would even say that it's part of the species or the DNA uh, to have some people control other people. And certainly we were getting really expert at it until uh, 1861 or so. And, and my, my problem with that is, uh, my question to you about that is, um, how deeply in, ingrained is the notion of slavery uh, in misogyny? Because these guys in the South saw themselves empowered over slaves. And, and it's an irresistible possibility that they also saw themselves empowered over women. Well, there were a number of women in the pre-bellum South, anti-bellum South, that were both slaves and concubines, um, who were house slaves, many of them. Uh, and uh, we know that because, uh, you know, we have- Thomas Jefferson, for example. Yes, and most of the planters, again, we're going to the highest stratus of society economically. Um, he had an economic relationship with, with men and women who were slaves. Uh, the male was responsible for the agrarian economy, and he was an agrarian, and uh, he couldn't keep his ideal place going unless he had slaves. Um, and yet, some of these slaves were his children. He treated them differently. We know that. They were freed. And that must have been a contract he had. Uh, with Sally Hemings, because he kept that contract. And uh, she was provided for also better than most slaves. She actually, we have some documentation that when he had dinner parties, she was there. <laughs> she wasn't serving. Uh, people talked about her as, quote, dusky Sally, and she was a very attractive woman. So, and she was also the half sister of his former wife, and he never remarried. He had plenty of chances to. Uh, but he didn't do it. So there's more to this relationship. And this relationship is illustrative of relationships that go as far back as we know slavery went. Now, going back to the ancient world where there were pastoral tribes and intermittent warfare, because that's the way people gained territory. The only way they gained territory was by defeating the people who were already there and reoccupying. And then what happened to the survivors of those who were already there. They tried to kill off all the men and uh, older uh, boys, and then they would take the women and younger children into their households. Right? Because after all, slaves are valuable. They work, they produce labor. They, they, they are like money, so to speak. So you can have a relationship with a slave, which is strictly transactional, all about money and flesh, or you can have a relationship <laughs> with a slave like Sally Hemings, where she becomes a part of your family and the mother of your children, but she is never really regarded as, an, as a wife would be in that society. She doesn't have the status and she doesn't have the respect and she doesn't have the security. Uh, she has to depend totally on the man. So connect that with, uh, with Dobbs, connect that with the Magus, connect that with um you know, the, the failure of Roe v. Wade, the people who oppose Roe v. Wade every day, um, connect that with the, the, all the people around the country who are voting against abortion every opportunity they get. Uh, what, what is in their minds and how much of this is, is part of their motivation? I think, and I'm gonna say something very radical here. I believe that what the Dobbs uh, decision has put in motion by taking this decision and throwing it up into the air chaotically and having it land on the states and saying, we'll let the states decide. You know, there can be 50 different rules and regulations, sets of rules and regulations, that what this has done is enslaved women, re-enslaved women. I think women are re-enslaved. And if you are in a situation where you don't have the power to change things, 
and you don't have the status to change things, one way you reconcile to that is you create a mythology about it, that this is a good thing. And, uh, you know, and uh, people are talking now about The Handmaid's Tale, that story about- I remember. Gilead, where uh, a democratic society has reverted to uh, a patriarchal society once again. Uh, it is certain there is a very narrow range of women that are privileged. And even those privileged women are caged. So the, the degree of caging depends on the different levels of status in a society. It's a very stratified society. And what we're going toward when we refuse uh, women control over their own health and bodies is uh, we're taking away their freedom, their most basic freedom. Gene, what about the family? You know, the family is a is an organic, living, breathing institution. It has uh, existed and persisted for many thousands of generations. Uh, but this affects the family, doesn't it? And um, you know, when you go backward like this, and when you unliberate people who thought they were liberated uh, in the context of the family, you're you're not only changing the culture, you're changing that institution. Uh, am I right? And where does that take us? Well, the family has been so idealized in terms of one model in the United States and Europe, which is the model of monogamy. Now, in Europe, it's monogamy for the woman, but traditionally not monogamy for the man. And most of European women are aware of that. I'm not saying there aren't purely monogamous relationships and marriages and Europe, there are, um, but there, again, human behavior being what it is, people rail against uh, that which will take away their own individual decisions over their own bodies. Men have freedom over their own bodies, women do not. And women have been fighting for that freedom as long as we have been a society here in the United States. And we got it for a number of years, and then it's been taken away again. And it, 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 to reinstate this on the basis of we have to save marriage because we have to save children, um, boys are growing up without fathers and so forth. All of that fallout occurs when there is a, a, a change in society in accord with the development of a society. If we didn't have these advances in biological science, we would not have the opportunity for uh, people to have children who can't have children biologically because they have some sort of a problem uh, with, maybe a woman has multiple miscarriages and can never have a child with that particular man. And if you have monogamy and you have this IVF available, then you can have children. And then men begin to see how these decisions that are made by abs these abstract people, uh, justices and so forth, who take the place of the person herself who needs to make this decision, they, they see how it impacts their lives. I mean, a lot of the times I've thought to myself, supposing you had not just a dog's decision, but you had a decision that mandated vasectomy for men after they had so many children. Uh, or they had a, a register that recorded how many children men actually had or how many. <laughs> I mean, then men would begin to get the idea of what women are experiencing in terms of being re-enslaved. Yeah. Well, now we get to the $64 million, zillion dollar question, okay? Um, there are half the country, arguably, on a demographic basis, and that means a half of 340 million people are women. Um, and um, th those women are the largest single non-white male voting bloc in the country, by far. And um, they could sweep over the polls in any national election if they chose to do so. But they're obviously not choosing to do so. They are being unliberated after all these years, and it's 100 years since the suffragette movement and their right to vote. They're squandering their vote on people who are misogynists, um, people who hate women, 
Um, why are they doing that? What is in their minds psychologically and from a social psychology point of view that would make them ignore the issue, give up their power, give up their right that they have fought so hard to have and vote for somebody who would take them back? Well, let's go back to the women in the little village where I was in Central America who opposed birth control and mandated that despite all of the tragedies that occurred with um, multiple pregnancies for each woman, they, they nevertheless, they had to go through that. And I saw even a, an extreme situation where a baby died because another child was born too soon after and the mother couldn't provide for the first one. Uh, so it, it, this was something, but, but they had some rationalization, some spiritual reason, some respect that was granted them in exchange for loss of their freedom that made them socialized into feeling this was the best and most and highest satisfaction they could have would be to become mothers and, and embrace that role and continue that role. And that tragedy was something that was uh, something that, that, that was intrinsic to life and, and that religion helped them cope with. So the very thing which um, the theology which rationalized and elevated marriage and family and multiple children and one one husband and fidelity and all that was the same um, reason why uh, they couldn't improve their lot by employing science. And, and the same thing goes on today. We have Steve Bannon, who we were talking about last week, saying that 40% of the MAGA movement that really made the MAGA movement successful were women. And we have um, uh, organizations that have cropped up that are now uh, very aggressive organizations uh, started by women, and especially in Florida, where they're going to school boards and saying, you can't have this book because it mentions um, not just normative, heterosexual, what we consider normative uh, relations, but it talks about uh, being gay or lesbian or transgender, and we can't have that because our children will be groomed into being this. We have to purify, we have to simplify, we have to go back to the model that we think is the only successful model for marriage and family in order to save the family. The fact that disenfranchised individuals, former slaves who have moved north, who have become urbanized, who live poor because there's redlining and other things that that economically do not sustain them and they have a much higher bar to leap in order to become commercially successful but these people by creating structures within which uh, there are different kinds of partnerships uh, two women for example having partnership and helping one another or one woman uh, having children but no no father in the household to help out who's relying on her larger family, maybe her parents or, or, or whatever, or just the whole try the ability to adapt. What's called the culture of poverty is really a set of adaptations to injustice, economic and social injustice that keeps people down. The culture of poverty provides these new examples and models for what family could be. And now the larger society is taking this on. Sexual practices have changed. Um, marriage models have changed. Relationship models, rearing children models have changed. And this is considered impure, polluted, wrong, and the reason for the problem rather than a reaction to the problem because they weren't basically allowed the same freedoms and leisure and uh, support uh, of another class of people who originally enslaved them. Well, if you look at this, um, you know, from the 50 foot, 50,000 foot level, and you look at it going forward, you know, you take everything we've talked about um, and try to see an America, it's limited to America for now, um, you know, that, that has um, more children, more, especially more unted, unwanted children, uh, in a society that has changed, um, where liberation has been the word of the day, and and you you take liberation out 
and you force women to have children they don't want, and, and this is really important, and children they cannot afford, you know, in the circumstance, the economic circumstances into which they've been forced. Um, what happens over decades? What happens to that society with all these unwanted children and families that are broken and unwilling, unable to care for them? There is a model of democracy called social democracy that was in place for many, many years in the Scandinavian countries and some other countries in the world, um, which actually worked better for both women and men, and still does to some extent. But the United States never embraced social democracy because it confused them with what is called socialism or communism. Um, communism and socialism are very different things because communists would really like to get rid of socialists, but um, people don't recognize that. And social democracy um, is not democratic socialism, which is what Bernie Sanders calls it. It's, it's really social democracy. Democratic socialism is a, a synonym for communism, and that doesn't exist. That existed in the Russian satellites, the USSR satellites in East Germany and Poland and so forth, but it never existed in the Scandinavian countries. It's social democracy. And what social democracy is, it just provides more support for people so you have a more equal society. The big problem now for women in society and the way women are being held down and controlled by the political system and particularly the conservative side of the political system is lack of, of, of good child care. Um, women need child care. They need good child care. They need child care in the workplace, which the Scandinavian countries often have, or they have child care, which is affordable. And the Scandinavian countries, which hire, with higher taxation in general, were able then to provide that for women. So they would lead, actually lead, lead uh, lives of, of greater uh, economic uh, security. If we're going to change our patterns of relationship, family, change the demographics of rearing children, we're also gonna have to change other parts of society. And if you don't wanna change those because they benefit one sex more than another sex or gender, then that sex or gender that has control of the lovers of power is going to resist. And that's what we're seeing in, in states like Tennessee, where, you know, uh, you don't want to give up that, that male control. In, in the Supreme Court, the extreme conservative justices, they don't want to change the patterns or the models. They don't want to adapt. They just want to punish in order to get women to accept what their concept of the model, we're going back to the German slogan again of Kinder Kusha Kusha, um, they punish women. I mean, they take away Planned Parenthood clinics, which provide for maternal health, and already child mortality has gone up as a result of that, and morbidity for women in pregnancy has gone up because of that. There's been more suffering because of that, um, where doctors as a class of people are being threatened by providing health care, uh, where Still, they have in 37 states child marriage permits, including the state of California, um, on the books. They're, they're not doing anything about that. Uh, what about domestic abuse? Uh, what about um, uh, the Me Too movement? Uh, that was plateaued as well. So you have to basically depress any levers of change and adaptation plus punish for trying to utilize them or put them in place in order to squeeze women in a Procrustean fit into the bed you have prepared for them, literally. I'm, I'm feeling a lot better about all of these things now, Jean. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for helping me understand. Um, we're out of time. I uh, wish we could go more. We will go more. Thank you so much, Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. See you again soon and aloha. Thank you, Gene. Thank you.